This is Paula Schmidt, and welcome to my theater of the mind. To hold time for writing and editing new material, which is taking one million years longer than expected, I have an idea. In addition to recording Evening's Kingdom, my cinematic epic fantasy across an ancient magical world, I'm also now recording Evening's Kingdom. The conversations, wide-ranging conversations with artists and thinkers on their work, their life, their adventures, processes, and routines. Kind of an inside the actors' studio meets the Tim Ferriss show. I hope. <laughs> of each guest, I'll ask, transport me. What is it like to be you? Tell me a story. What are the skills, routines, and philosophies that have most helped you towards your dreams? How do you think about and approach a project when it first invites you? How does that change throughout your process? Regrets, dreams, and ambitions. The audio and transcripts will be permanently available on eveningskingdom.com for your perusal, and my email subscribers will, of course, get a heads up each time new content is up. As well as extra multivarious tidbits. So, if you are not signed up to my, admittedly, very sporadic newsletter, please visit me at eveningskingdom.com and click subscribe. Ultimately, I'll release Evening's Kingdom: The Conversations via Apple Music, Spotify, etc., in batches between seasons of the story. These conversations will, no doubt, wend their ways into Evening's Kingdom. In the years that come, you may well recognize characters and ideas first discussed here. I hope it will be a delicious window into process, for myself included. Also, I'm expanding our conversation because I love to learn. I love listening to and learning from artists and those with unusual bends of mind. And I suspect, my dear listener, you do too. So. I hope what follows will impact and enchant you, as much as, perchance, it will the endeavor which is, evening's kingdom. And so, we begin. We continue. This is Paula Schmidt. My guest today is Pat Galt, a dear friend, an artist and waymaker, and a military veteran. Pat became a para rescueman, PJ. At 18, after a decade, Pat moved to a unit in Alaska, where he also became a climber and backcountry skier, leading him to work in ski patrol, avalanche education, and as a climbing ranger for the National Park Service on Denali. Pat has an MFA from Sierra Nevada College in creative writing, and explores alternative treatment methods for PTSD and depression, such as meditation and psychedelics. But it is his growing relationship with the Alaskan backcountry which has truly transformed his life. Accordingly, he founded the Alaska Institute of Curiosity and Exploration, or Alice, to help redefine our understanding of nature as the original entheogen, the temporal and spatial reality that links us to our spirit. You can visit Pat at AliceQuest dot com to learn more about the deep backcountry quests that he guides into the Alaskan wilderness, and I do recommend it to your attention. That's AliceQuest dot com. Sign up for his newsletter and stay tuned. I first met Pat in Tucson, Arizona, way back in twenty ten, twenty eleven. We stayed in touch over the years, exchanging writings and the like. And last year. My husband joined Pat on the first Alice Quest. He loved it. A few months later, we all met up at Metadelic, a psychedelic conference in Las Vegas, which was fascinating. And there, via the epic Master Lieutenant Roger Sparks, Pat was connected with the Heroic Hearts Project, which offers a proprietary program to veterans for psychedelic treatment options to heal their PTSD, primarily working with ayahuasca retreat centers. Due to the powerful healing ayahuasca provides, the Heroic Hearts program guides veterans to help them get the most out of their time on retreat. 
and also helps set them up for success when they return home. This is Pat's story. Tell me about the retreat. I haven't heard your details yet. Yeah, it was... Uh... I I don't have all the words for you know because words are kind of limiting at some point but yeah. um so it was in Peru in the Amazon and is an area of Peru that's outside of the ayahuasca tourism industry uh so it was pretty separated from all of that and it was um it was three of us veterans and then two board members for heroic arts project and uh went to this retreat um that is run by a westerner who, from london who is one of the very few westerners who's actually been properly trained in the mestizo tradition uh to be a shaman and this particular guy, uh, a little bit older, and has his own substance abuse background and found relief from that through ayahuasca. And uh, he's built this really beautiful retreat center that's very secluded and, and just very quiet um, in the jungle. And uh, it was... Um, you know, the ceremonies are done in a maloca, which is like a huge wooden yurt with screen walls to let it so it's open air. Mm -hmm. And the ceremonies are done at night with not even candlelight because ayahuasca is a feminine spirit. And so it's supposed to be done under the moonlight. Um, so to I guess save you the details of oh, you know no. just like I love the details and you know not everyone listening will have had experience so go on. okay yeah so you know the the drink the ayahuasca drink is made from typically two plants uh, and one of those plants has DMT the other one has an MAO, MA, MAO inhibitor. Uh, which allows the DMT to last a little bit longer and you go through these waves of experience. And, but then this particular shaman adds a tree from the forest and the ingredients of a tree into the forest. And so he's known to have a very strong, um, type of ayahuasca. And so we would all show up in the Maloka at sundown and you have your mattress, your bucket to puke into. You'd have, you know, a blanket and a pillow. And as soon as the sun went down and it started getting dark, then the shaman has these songs called um, Icaros, which are like the best way I can explain them is these like melancholic journeying songs. Mm -hmm. um, like you could imagine it in some like really dark fantasy film or something. <laughs> and, but he's, he has, he starts the ceremony by whistling one of those and like this song will like never leave my head, but it's like this one, his main song and he'd whistle that song into the bottle that he had the ayahuasca in. And then he'd call you up by name and you'd go up, he'd give you a shot glass with your drink in it and you'd think your intentions for that particular ceremony and into the drink. And then you'd take your shot, this really nasty, horrible tasting fluid and <laughs> like chocolate vomit <laughs> yeah it is Ugh. and then you'd go and you know sit back down on your mattress and wait for the effects to take hold and you just sort of sit there and like you know night would descend and then the amazon just gets insane at night like the amazon just wakes up and it's anything from like millions of cicadas that are kind of the cicadas there have this like droning sound that is almost like you ever heard of the monks, the Buddhist monks when they yeah all uh, drone together. Yeah, it's beautiful. Wow, it's like that, but it's just millions of cicadas in the jungle, and then you have on top of that, you know, the monkeys and the birds and these frogs that are really loud, and uh, 
basically the entire place explodes. And uh, as it gets darker, you know, ayahuasca takes hold. And it's almost like the jungle is this, like, I don't know, like, it's like you're in a coliseum and the jungle is the audience in the jungle is just like rooting the beast to come into the Coliseum and meet you. And the beast is like Aya and she's, she's going to show you what it is to die, you know? And, um, so while this is happening, the shaman has his rattle, which is like this branch with a bunch of dry leaves on it. And he's walking around singing Icaros. And so he's almost doing this. The way I read it is, you know, he's like the human bridge between what the jungle is saying. And then he's sort of conjuring the plant spirits from within you is the way I kind of felt that interaction as being. And um, we did three ceremonies in a row, three nights in a row. And my first ceremony was it was like a setting of the stage i'd say by i and she showed up as this sort of infinite black snake that was wrapping herself around around me and um and it was her taking me back to certain places i had been in the mountains here in alaska oh. and very clear messages that like I've been speaking to you for many years, but you haven't been listening Mm. and, you know, through nature. And it also came with like some visions or just some feelings of really kind of dark stuff, but not bad dark, Mm -hmm. more of just like this, I guess the best way I can explain it is it's almost like this desire to return to the earth and mm-hmm. which means death and decay. Mm-hmm. It's and part so of life. Yeah. Yeah. And so seeing that process of like, I kept feeling like my, one of my legs was decaying and mushrooms were growing out of it. And I wanted more of my body to do that. And, uh, it, I'd say that first ceremony was her just setting the stage of, and saying, you know, you're mine. You're going to one day die and decay into the soil and plants are going to grow through your, from your nutrients. And yeah. me just being like, you know, okay, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And I, I had a similar response where I was saying to her, to the snake, ayahuasca, eat my heart, you know, take all of me. It, and, yeah. it, and it feels so natural and you're not afraid. And I've always been afraid of right. that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, for me, being so rooted in wanting to be in nature all the time, I had the feeling of, or as, it was like I was being shown by Aya that I receive fellowship from the land as much as I do, or potentially more than I do from other human beings. Mm. And not like this metaphorical fellowship, but like real actual fellowship. And it was just a clear message as I took it of like, don't waste so much time in the company of other people, like go to the land more. And so as the first ceremony, the second one was a a higher dose and it turned into like, like I've experienced ego death on psilocybin before, and this took me back to it. And by the way, like both of these ceremonies involve purging, which for me is puking. You know, it's like the puking on ayahuasca isn't just puking. You're not puking just food up just because it's gross. You're puking like parts of your psyche out, it feels like. You know, you're just like purging parts of yourself that ayahuasca is deciding does not need to be in you anymore. And like the second one started that way with the, this purge that was just like, I was tripoded on the floor over my bucket. (laughs) Just like, just like it felt, it felt like I was extracting CSF from my skull 
and then, pu- <laughs> and then puking it out. What, like, what, what is CSF? Uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Like, oh uh, my God. Oh my God. Like was, That's visceral. Yeah, I felt, uh, well, yeah, I felt like I was extracting it out with like certain memories. Yeah. And then just like puking it out. And uh, maybe you were. It, yeah. And you know, it's, it's weird because whenever somebody purges, you can feel it. Yeah, the other inside people. of yourself. Yeah, yeah. Then the local, like everybody's driving on kind of the same wavelengths when you're experiencing this stuff. Yeah, that's like, shocked my, to me too. Yeah. Yeah, and one of my buddies, um, who was there, this other veteran, like he had a lot of fear to deal with, um, and he would just descend into the depths of his fear and like go on these screaming fits. You know, it's like pitch black in the jungle, jungle's going crazy. And then there's this guy with this blood curdling scream going on. Probably a pretty big guy too, huh? (laughs) Yeah. In the full throes, in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. Like you help each other carry it. It's right. Yeah. Profound. And then I had, I'm sure you had this too, where you feel, I mean, affection isn't the right word maybe, but as other people are purging, you're so happy for them. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I felt that anyway. And then the buckets, yeah. like they seem to take on this otherworldly quality, like the contents, right? Like the, the snakes and clouds and whatever darkness, and they'll be really heavy. And I, I actually had the opportunity to facilitate a couple of ceremonies with a group and I was entirely sober. And so one of my jobs was to clean the buckets you know, and take them from people as they're, they're in their ceremonies. And I still felt profoundly woven in and part of that web and the buckets were markedly heavier. Even if somebody had only actually purged what looked like a small amount, you could feel uh-huh. the weight of it change. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it blew my mind. But I, I knew, I knew it, but it still blew my mind. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of magic going on, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, the whole thing is like the thoughts that are coming to you aren't your own. It's there's no way to explain it other than just saying that you're not alone in that experience. There's a completely different entity there. Yeah. And cuz some of the things that were being said to me uh were not things that would originate inside of my head, you know, mm-hmm. and they came in the form of feelings. So take that for what it's worth but it's like um the three ceremonies that i did all it was like three acts to a play you know there was this arc to them where it's like something that didn't make complete sense in the first ceremony something happened in the third ceremony that made that make sense so it was like the three ceremonies had been planned out beforehand by intelligent design and I was just sort of riding a wave the whole time. Yeah. Um, and a second piece to that, like, to not being alone, you also are given this feeling, this knowing that you never have been alone and aren't right. alone. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that you're not, you know, separate from anything. And, uh, and it's funny because, like, this isn't all, like, I don't know, world literature, religion literature, and but discovering it for yourself feels very profound. And you're like, oh, this is, these are like the simplest truths, but I didn't, I didn't see them or I didn't feel them. Right. Well, and that's why I think that indigenous worldview is just pragmatic Mm -hmm. more than anything else is because, yeah, when you experience these sorts of things on psychedelics as a Westerner, again, with our lack of proximity to having a relationship with nature, this stuff is just like mind blowing. Right. But I bet (laughs) if I bet if you were immersed in a particular natural space that they had a day to day relationship with and understood it on a certain level, then I don't think that these experiences would be as groundbreaking. It would be like, kind of them being shown something that they already somewhat knew in a Mm -hmm. lot of ways 
because they had felt it just in their day-to-day interactions with the land. But to us, it's just like this, holy shit, you know, like this is crazy, but it's not crazy. It's just that we're crazy (laughs) and not being connected to the world that we evolved to be connected with in the first place. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad you had that experience. So like now, as you move back into your previous life, you're trying to sort through the uh, the chaff, I guess, and retain the magic. How um how many weeks has it been since you've been back? Uh, probably about four. It's been about a month. Yeah. So the integration. Are you guys still in touch with the? Uh, the people who held the ceremony? Uh, not the particular people who held the ceremony, but the organization, Hero Cards Project, they have coaches that they pair you up with to help you with integration and everything. And so, yeah, we're still in touch with them. And we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but like specific to PTSD, uh, how would you say the impact from the Heroic Hearts Project has been? It's It's definitely been huge, you know, but I think that, that the impact is really a it's a collection of multiple uh ways of approaching the same process if that makes sense like mm-hmm. it's going into an ayahuasca is put within the same box as the self treatment I've done on psilocybin uh the same box as my meditation practice that I've initiated, mm-hmm. same box as the talk therapy I've been doing for years, same box as just st- keeping my body healthy through eating right and exercising. And it's in the same box as me having a relationship with the landscape, which I would say is actually the, the all encompassing. I would say that that is the box, you know, as far as how ayahuasca affected my process with PTSD, I would say it was definitely a very powerful tool among all the other tools. Um, but I think what I learned most from it, and this is direct messaging from Aya, is that everything else that I've been doing, especially building a relationship with nature already, I was just being told that I'm on the right path and I just need to keep walking it. Again, back to this like process oriented mindset of, of healing where this isn't ever going to end. I'm never going to reach a point where it's like, I'm healed. I'm good. This is a process that I'm on now for the rest of my life. And ayahuasca was really just this like confirmation of like, like, yeah, here's, here's your life. Here are all the lanes that you're trying to walk at the same time. Here's the lane among all of those that you should be walking towards Mm -hmm. more balanced, more healing. And I think ayahuasca did that for me. And it sounds like it does something similar for a lot of people where it's like out of the clutter of your life, what is the thing that is kind of being buried underneath everything else. That is the thing that you need, that your life is really drawing you towards. Like that is the thing that is seeking you. Yeah. And all you need to do is allow that thing to happen. It's thrilling that all the work you've been doing to bring Alice quest into being like, it's just right in, in focus with this and it will help other people in the same way, you know, without ayahuasca, just being, in it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that again, building that relationship with the land, like, does it, a lot of people come out of, like, when you and I were at Meet Delic, I, I mean, most of the speakers that were there referred to this connection with nature as a result of their psychedelic experiences. And my big question coming out of those is just, well, what is, what is a connection with nature? Like, what does that mean to us mm-hmm. as Westerners? You know, what does it mean to you? It means that you spend 
enough time on a particular piece of land um, or with just like in a certain ecosystem within a certain region to understand it. It's to me the same as a human relationship. Like you can't have a very successful human relationship if you just go out and have drinks every Friday night, you know, that's an yeah. acquaintance. That's not a relationship. So God, I love that so much. That's, that's yeah. intense. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's weird. I think it's weird to, to talk about having these connections with nature when we don't actually know what that means. If you again, fall back on indigenous worldview as the found foundational structure of having a relationship with a particular place then us going out on a backpacking trip every once in a while is not us having a connection with a particular place you know sure well so with alice quest you know you would put people in this immersion experience in the alaskan backcountry which would be profound in and of itself but part of your after care I guess would be encouraging them to develop a specific relationship with their local ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. Cause giving people experiences is great. Like taking them into the Alaska back country is great, but it's really just like, we're seeing it just like as, as a catalyst for mm -hmm. them to take off with in the rest of their life. At some point, I'd like to just put myself out of business because other people, the people who I bring on trips are just doing it on their own. They don't need, they don't need me to do that. Nobody needs a guide to get them into nature. Like we are already evolved, ready to go into nature. We just have to understand that and accept it. Now, what would but, you suggest if someone's somewhere that's really, really urban and it's not a popular, it's not an option for them to leave? Like, say they live in New York City, what would you recommend that they do? Yeah, that's. I think even if we construct our own version of nature on top of nature, on top of the land that was already there, like Manhattan, for example, the spirit of that place still is there. And this is, yeah, it's a good question because it's something I've been like arguing with some of my friends about and mm -hmm. trying to come to terms with of, again, the building that I'm sitting in is made out of the same molecules of, that make up anything else in the world. And so in a sense, even what we construct is, at a very fundamental level, nature. Right. You know, nothing supernatural and the, or in a, in a vacuum that's outside nature. Yeah. Right. I, but right. then again, and that's the non dualist thing, you know. True. But the thing, the version of nature that, that I believe is uh, maybe referential for truth is these other life forms like trees, for example, mm. I think what makes that type of nature uh, really important is that is to think about the fact that human consciousness is probably not the only kind of consciousness mm -hmm. and that trees is life forms that we can consider inanimate, even things that we won't even consider life forms like rivers or mountains. To think that there isn't a certain level of consciousness emanating from those things is not, that's not founded necessarily in any truth other than what we've decided is the scientific truth. But right. our science still cannot describe what consciousness actually is. <laughs> so we're really just guessing when we say that these things don't have consciousness. And so selectively, right? In a way that allows us to keep plowing over everything. I, I want right. to come back to that, but real quick with uh, maybe putting constructing nature on top of nature and creating relationships with other life forms. 
So maybe in somebody in a really urban environment, at least just to get started or for the next five years while they have to live there. What if, what would you think to somebody like planting trees and keeping bees on top of their apartment building, you know, and really engaging deeply with that relationship? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's kind of what I'm getting at is that I think the other forms that you can perceive in your own mind have their own perception and if they do then they have a perception of you and so then that means that like a tree for example in a park if you can go to a park in the city and think that that tree sees you in your existence in the same proportion as you see it in its existence but it's a different form of consciousness and seeing mm -hmm. each other then yeah. that is that interplay that I think nature is so necessary for is it gives you a reference point for your own existence without it. If you're just in a vacuum with just other human beings, then it's like we're just having the same conversation over and over and over again. With no uh, sense of perspective in the larger web. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And it's funny as a kid, like, I think so many of us just naturally felt that I had, I know how silly this sounds, but I also know that you get it. I had specific friends that were trees and I would go see them on the playground and my girlfriend and I would take them offerings and we weren't like baby witches or anything. It was just something that we did. The tree was our <laughs> friend. And then, you know, now 30 years later, it's like, wow. I mean, maybe that was more real than a lot of the other things that I did in those interceding decades that seemed more grown up than, I don't know. Well, <laughs> but no, I it's, mean, it's funny. Yeah, to put it into perspective, I guess, it's uh, like the Denina, who are the Athabas one of the Athabascan tribes up here in Alaska, uh, they, and it's not just the Denina that believe this is, uh, is believed in a lot of different indigenous cultures but you know they believe that even rocks had a certain level of consciousness and that to a westerner sounds ridiculous most likely uh because through our science we've decided that rocks are made of these elements and there's no life in any of those obviously it's but, like a colonial mindset <laughs> really right yeah it's like we have this authority to define that you know and yeah but i think again so again that gets lost in this idea of fairy tale right oh that's denying a fairy tale that rocks have consciousness that's kind of cute mm -hmm. but if you walk back from that and think of how they might have come to that conclusion having been these people who were never contacted by westerners until like the mid 1800s and who lived a life in on the land that for archaeologists is incredibly difficult to to pick up on because they didn't build any permanent structures everything they had was made out of uh natural substances that decayed at a fast rate um so they were extremely close to the land uh physically and psychologically and so putting yourself in those shoes where that is how you're born that's what you're born into. You're probably picking up on a lot of things on the land that a Westerner will never pick up on. Yeah. Um, like your senses were not really evolved to be partitioned out into five senses. They were evolved to all work together and for you to have a certain amount of synesthesia when experiencing yeah. the land. And which is kind of a mainstay in psychedelic experiences as well, by the way. Uh, huh. but your body when you go into that synesthesia which i've experienced on like a last summer on a 10-day solo trip in the arctic you know like you start picking up on things on the land that there's no way you would pick up on if you were just out for a hike or something like that like to imagine living an entire life where you're never distracted by the things that we get distracted by these days uh your body and your mind would be working on a completely different level and so for them, this belief that rocks had consciousness uh, probably didn't seem that 
Well, it definitely didn't seem to them crazy at all because they probably thought, well, I have consciousness as a human being walking around. Uh, and I don't really see much of a difference between me and any of the other animal life forms or any of the other plant life forms or really any of the landscape because when I die, my body decays into the ground mm -hmm. and the nutrients from my body gets used up by the land to become plants, to be eaten by animals, you know, and the cycle goes on. So why wouldn't my consciousness be a part of that? You know, yeah. so consciousness then is no longer housed within the human brain. It's this thing that is dispersed all throughout the earth and throughout all forms on earth, because it's no different from the molecules of your skin that decay into the earth and get used by it. Do we know if they experience, experienced or experience consciousness differently than like experiencing it as if it was sort of all one mind all the time? Or were they dipping in and out of maybe having personified experiences? Do you know what I'm asking, I guess? Like as far as the well, did native they feel worldview? Like their, were their thoughts? Yeah, the native worldview. For, and could you spell the name of the... Yeah, the Denina, they're, it's Denina. properly spelled D-E-N-A apostrophe I-N-A. Thanks. I, I just, I wonder if they experience their thoughts as if they were, air quotes, their own thoughts, or if they experience thoughts as if it was from, you know, a unified whole that was well, they, everything, all of nature. Yeah, so, like, they believed in six different dimensions where thoughts could travel between those dimensions. So animals inhabited one of those dimensions, their ancestors inhabited another one of those dimensions. And they had like this host of other people like the mountain people and the tree people who they couldn't see with their own eyes, but were there just as real. And um, they uh, thought that thoughts could travel between those different dimensions so when they would go out and hunt moose, for example, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't think that they were hunting moose because they figured that the moose could hear them thinking, "I'm <laughs> going to go hunt moose." Yeah, because it, it's it's uh, and then the Navajo who share the Athabascan language roots with the Dena'ina mm -hmm. um, have a belief that uh, you know the wind the wind is consciousness. And so, because if you think about thought, it's this unseeable thing, but so is the wind, but we know oh, that the wind that. is there. We know that the air is there. So why wouldn't thought also be this thing that's transferable uh, outside of ourselves? Why would it only be housed inside of us? It's the concept that our, thoughts and our consciousness is just unique to us and inside of our own brains that is one that is one way of seeing it just one mm -hmm. and that's the way that has been perpetuated in western society and that's it and it's a new concept really yeah oh that's that's fascinating and then do you know then they must have experienced death so differently yeah do you know the concepts around death um not specifically, but I do know that that most indigenous, and this comes from David Abram, but most indigenous peoples see time in a circular fashion rather than linear, which is appropriate for being close to nature and seeing it that way. Sure, the which, seasons. Yeah. Yeah, and also just like the death and rebirth cycle. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that death in most of those cultures was just seen as that necessary step towards rebirth. Yeah. Objectives kill the process. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a good one to, to embrace, you know, maybe imbuing death with a sense of honor and reverence, you know, even as we work to also reverence life and take care and responsibility of our, of our, of our life as it is. But, to not view death and sickness with such terror because it's the most natural thing in the world. Right. Yeah. And it's, 
I think that that's the weird part about these psychedelic experiences in, for me, in relation to the relationship I've built with the land is that death to me now, it's not, it isn't that big, scary thing, but you're almost expected to talk about it as if it is in our society. And if you don't, then people think maybe you're weird and suicidal, you know? Um, We can work on that though. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think it's all tone makes a big difference right it's just not Mm -hmm. something people westerners are used to talking about in tones other than terror and so you have to be careful when you initiate it you know right yeah of course but i would say just the even talking about death as if it's as if it's this I don't know. Since we look at time in a linear fashion most of the time mm-hmm. in our culture, even if we're religious, we tend to look at death as this like end, this cliff you drop off off of, and you go to this like really weird fairy tale land of <laughs> whatever you've decided. <laughs> like in the Christian scenario, it's like, okay, I hope that person was saved by Jesus, you know, and I'm just going to assume that they were so that I know that they're in heaven. That's a really kind of, I mean, this is my own opinion about it, but that's kind of a really crazy way to look at it of death, you know? pretty strange cult. It's amazing it's risen to prominence the way that it has. <laughs> yeah, it but, really started yeah. rooted in nature in the same kind of looking at things in a circular fashion. Mm-hmm. But, But that's how I think, looking at death and talking about it that's why it's so hard in the western society is because is because it's we've constructed it as this cliff to fall off of that Mm -hmm. none of us want to think about but to actually feel somewhat to feel positive towards it feels weird you know and that's where i'm saying it's like it feels like people would almost see that as suicidal is because you're looking at death in this positive fashion when in reality that doesn't mean that i want to die sooner Mm -hmm. than later it just means that i am actually opening more space up in my life because i realize now that there's nowhere i'm trying to go you know there's not like something I'm trying to achieve. I'm going to end up in the same place as everything Mm -hmm. else in nature. I'm going to end up in the ground being absorbed into something new, you know, and being shown that is really freeing. It is. And it makes you harder to control too, which I think is partly why this worldview has been promoted so much by leaders, you know, Mm -hmm. But there, it's such an interesting movement now happening with all these spheres you're talking about, like the psychedelics movement and meditation and mindfulness and spending more time close to nature. And we're, it's right. rising. It's coming back, you know? Yeah. It's healthier, more rightful narrative. Maybe rightful is not the right word, but just us resuming our, our place in the proper order of things. Right. Yeah. But it has to come with us having that relationship with nature. And Mm -hmm. I I just don't think that it makes any contextual sense without that. You know, it's like doing these things, these different spheres, as you called them, like in the, within the echo chamber of human existence Mm -hmm. is one thing, but it's without context, I think. And so I think the conversation of, if you look at the psychedelics industry and like that conference that we went to in in Vegas, it's like how much money is being poured into that, you know, because people see the potential to capitalize on it. But what, you know, it's how about the conservation of raw land then? Because does that psychedelics industry have a leg to stand on without there being raw land available to go and have that experience? Now you have a lot of people having that experience on psychedelics and wondering what the hell any of it meant. Because they didn't have a relationship with land before that. And now the questions that they're asking and the answers that they're seeking exist on that raw land. So if we just don't conserve anything, if we just keep manipulating nature the way that we are, then do we have these big 
peak experiences on psychedelics and then have no reference point with which to find those answers to the questions that we're now asking. Yeah. So there's so much zeal going into it, but there needs to be an equal amount, if not more zeal going into just preserving land. Yeah, this this is a major tangent, but I've also personally, the healing power of just being in nature, like in a really nuts and bolts sort of way has been pretty amazing for me lately. Like I, I was really into CBD for a while. I have Hashimoto's and so that comes with some inflammation and at different times I've had anxiety, although I think diet and meditation and more time in nature has helped with that. So it's not really something I, I struggle with like I used to. But I, I was taking CBD just about every day. I'd read these studies about how it can help people to combat COVID better, uh-huh. you know, because you're less inflamed. And then I came across Wim Hof's ideas where it's like a lot of breath work and then also taking cold showers at the end of your regular hot shower and meditating outside when it's cold and just not wearing as much clothes. And I've actually gone completely off CBD and my body I can see is like significantly less inflamed and I feel like amazing, euphoric. Now there's nothing anyone can sell me there. I'm now not buying CBD or interested in buying CBD, but just the power of spending time outside when it's cold without clothes to remove you from that experience, that teacher, as Wim Hof talks about it, of the cold, of the wind, of the synesthesia of your senses working together. It's really exciting. Yeah. And that's, it it is. And it's again, pragmatic in in a big sense, because you, all these things that we are doing, like what you're talking about with meditation and, and, you know, CBD and psychedelics and all these things, like we're doing those because we don't have that exposure to nature that our bodies really need. Yeah. It's so much of mental health work goes into just getting people back in touch with their bodies because that is the antithesis to you being stuck in your head. If you want to get out of your head, which a lot of like PTSD is like a hyper egoism, right? It's Mm -hmm. like you being stuck in the past and the future, which is all that your ego does. It's what it was evolved to do. And so the treatment for that is to get you more in touch with your body because that is using the portion being in touch with your body is your brain is part of your body too. And your senses is is your ability to sense the present and so it all ties into eventually that mindfulness practice especially meditation of Mm -hmm. being in the present by being more in touch with your body and your senses and where did your where did your senses evolve they evolved in the environment they didn't evolve in climate control right you know and so Mm -hmm. the fact that we live in climate control pretty much all of the time means that we're subduing our senses constantly and what's that doing to our mental health you know mm-hmm. like do we also, have so yeah we're living outside of seasons in a way that would impact our our body's natural yeah rhythm we've too, constructed our own idea of time for example yeah. and all of the patterns that come with that you know for example up here my buddy Madrook, who's a yupik philosopher talks about how the yupik who are an Eskimo people out uh, in Western Alaska, they, their concept of time was not the Western concept of time because the sun cycle here is measured in 365 days, not 24 hours. And so the concept of like what a day is in a temperate zone or a tropical zone doesn't make sense up here. And so we've constructed these ideas of time and then, And because we've done that, we've put our bodies on these schedules that are completely out of touch with the cycles for the regions that we live in. And so if you tie all of this together and think of like, okay, well, if my mind and body are attached, which obviously they are, but I'm putting my body through these stressors of like not being able to just tune into the environment, Mm -hmm. then what is that doing to my mental health? Yeah, It's no wonder that we're so mentally unbalanced in our culture because our bodies are not doing what they evolved to do because we're not allowing them to. Right. 
So we have to add in all these other practices in order to just get back to mental health. Yeah. Although, you know, if it's not an option for someone to make a radical change to where they know they need to be, even just starting out with going outside in the morning, like as close to first thing as possible and looking at natural light and feeling the air as it is and not modified with temperature control. Yeah. That alone, I think, has some profound effects, like especially with sleep cycle and stuff, but also the way that you feel, especially if you can do it barefoot. It sounds right. so simple, but it really makes a big difference. You're just oriented differently, if not for the whole day, for a little while. And then if you can, you know, to repeat that throughout the day, spending some time outside. Right. And I'm talking to yeah. myself. I mean, I'm on my laptop. I'm basically, this time of year, I'm glued to it. It's terrible. But I do... Right. Like now my big part of my process, I'll, I'll get up in the mornings and I make sure I look at natural light and I meditate outside and I do some movement outside. And, you know, I'm not talking like a lot of time necessarily. Sometimes it might just be a couple minutes, but it makes such a difference. And then you have, I'm realizing now that I'm talking to you, you have this kind of relationship with your local squirrels and trees. And it's just such a shift. It's, it's deeply pleasant. It sounds so small, but it's huge. Yeah, I mean, get it however you can, really, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, there is reality either way. So you've been talking a lot about your meditation process. How, uh, do you want to talk about that in some detail? Like what you... Yeah, the meditation practice I've been doing is I'll just, before I go to bed for 45 minutes, I'll, I'll sit and start by focusing on my breath and my body and try to find, you know, scan my body, find out where my tension is and it's always in the same areas. Um, and then I have a few different directions I can go with it. One is just focusing on my breath and my body. Another is focusing on sounds outside of me, uh, and in a non judgmental way, you know, like the dogs barking next door, like focusing on those, I usually get pissed off about those. So focusing on those and trying not to be judgmental about them, <laughs> Um, and then another one is just watching my thoughts run and seeing where they land. Uh, and it kind of just depends on what my brain is doing lately. It's been just watching my thoughts run because they've been running strong, you know, so it's, I just let the, pra the, that time that I'm sitting down to just sort of lend itself to me as far as what it, what I need to do during that time. And so it flows, um, it? yeah. And it, I mean, this is like, almost a year and a half into doing this every day now, you know? So I started out with just like 20 minutes a day in the morning and just focusing on, my, just trying to focus on my breath. And so I've worked my way up to this point of like, what do I need to allow myself to do today? You know? And yeah. uh, so that's, yeah, that's kind of how it's running right now. I love that. I know you got to go, but just to ask how, how do you experience your thoughts? Are they visual? Are they words that just kind of come into your mind? People think differently, so I'm always curious what the experience is like. I think it might be a mixture. I think yeah. some of it's pretty visual, and then some of it is like me having a conversation with myself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I love that. So if people want to sign up for an Alice Quest adventure with you, is that something they can do? Yeah. They can check out the website and we have a newsletter. So that's the best way to keep up to date. We don't have social media, um, but it's alicequest.com. Alicequest.com. Pat, thank yeah. you so much. What a pleasure and an inspiration. I wrote down a lot of the things that you said. Yeah. Thanks, Paula. Yeah. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. This is Paula Schmidt. And thank you so much for listening. If you're enjoying this little adventure endeavor, please visit Evening's Kingdom on Apple Music, subscribe, and leave a review. I love doing this, but I need your help. I need your reviews to help get Evening's Kingdom published. Every single review means so much because it means the world to know you're out there, loving this thing into life along with me, and two, because each one is evidence to the gatekeepers that you love Evening's Kingdom and want more. If you're a creator or an entrepreneur yourself, you know how much reviews help. 
And so, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. To leave your review, please subscribe via Apple Music, scroll down, and click five stars. Any words you'd like to leave as well would really help. Let me know your favorite characters, story arcs, how you like to listen. I love it all, and thank you. I've recorded all of book one for you here, and truly, I am going to start recording book two for you here soon. My day job has just been a shit show, to be honest. I just haven't had any time. <laughs> but I'm hoping things will ease up just a little bit here soon. This is Paula Schmidt, and thank you so much for listening. Please stay tuned. The rest of the story is just down the road.